be an epic homo sapien and transition yourself to become an epic homo evolutus. This is our moment after billions of years of evolution. We have the opportunity to create the most spectacular existence known to this galaxy. Once I sold uh, Braintree Venmo, I was trying to figure out what to do that would genuinely benefit the human race, bridging us to the 25th century. What I've been doing over the past year is me being my best self playing in the biggest playground I can find. And I have never experienced more joy in life than I do in pursuing this. Some people are going to go like, what Brian's doing is cringe. I sincerely do not care what anyone thinks of me in this moment of time. I really care about the 25th century respecting me. The last thing in the whole world I want to do is anything that increases acceptance according to current norms. Maybe for somebody watching this, it's kind of like a stack rank of, okay, if you do nothing else, do yeah. this. Okay, I'll give you seven things. And these are the power laws. Hello. And welcome to a very exciting episode of the Arthi and Sri Ram show. The most measured man in history, uh, the, pers the tech billionaire who wants to live forever. You've definitely heard of Brian Johnson, our guest today. And because he's been all over the internet, uh, you know, his mission, his, uh, his, his sort of drive to measure himself and live forever. You've probably seen his videos. You've definitely seen his photos. He's been out there. And the truth is, Arti and I wanted to go into this conversation to really just understand him. Um, I never met Brian before. Uh, this is actually the first time that we, him and I had actually ever kind of connected on audio or video. And honestly, this really blew us away. Because the truth is, what I really wanted to figure out was how did Brian go from being sort of a typical tech entrepreneur, a very successful one, but kind of a typical one that you kind of feel like you know the story of, to someone who who looks different, acts different, and seems to be trying to create a new religion of sorts. And honestly, Brian just blew us away. Uh, how articulate he is, how well thought out he is. And, not, and it's not just about how to be healthier because we do get into that, but it is really about, in his words, how to be epic. And Arthi and I, you know, there's one of these conversations where we just kind of came away being so inspired, so pumped. So uh, we had a great time. You hope, we hope you enjoy it too. And before we get to the episode, like always, one of the best ways you can help us is help us with the algorithm gods. So wherever you're watching or listening to this, if this is on Apple, leave a review for us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or if you're watching this on YouTube, like and hit the notifications button, leave a comment, because we would love to hear from you. But now, without further ado, the man whose second part episode may come in 100 years from now, Brian Johnson. I think you are questioning something that we take for granted. And that is a noble, noble thing to do, which is like, hey, we take dying for granted, and you're questioning that. That's, I think, just purely noble just for that. And the second part of it is, I think what you're doing is, one, you're you're testing it on yourself. You're making everything you do open source and giving it all out. I mean, you have like you sell all the while, but I don't think it's like kind of a tiny thing. Like you're basically putting it all out there. I think there are two things which could happen, right? One is maybe you fail, right? Or maybe you succeed, right? But I just love the fact that you are out there you know, kind of like a modern day, like pioneers in the old days, you know, try to go to the South Pole, North Pole, climber, but you're kind of out there on a different kind of frontier. And just for speaking for all of us, right? Like maybe you fail, but I really hope you succeed because if you succeed, it means so many good things for everyone else. So I just want to kind of say that in front of which way I just truly admire what you're doing. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate that a lot. I feel seen. Thank you. I think uh, for me, um, Brian, I will say this. I think Shriram was more of a convert way earlier than I was. It took me a while to get there. Like, I, you know, I started, I followed you on all the channels, like on, on YouTube, on, on Twitter, X, everything. And um, I didn't quite get it until um, I started, I think, in somewhere, somewhere you'd said something like, you haven't, like, the, the big problem for humanity right now is for everyone who's skeptical and who's making fun of me and all of that, we haven't cracked aging. And I was like, oh, that's right. Like, you know, if you forget all the noise about like what you're doing, why you're doing it, your motivations, what people think, 
uh, the science behind it and all of that, really it just comes down to there is a fundamental problem that we've all assumed to what Sriram said that we've all taken for granted and but we haven't really cracked it. We haven't really like applied first principles to it. We haven't kind of looked at it and said, wait, but does this have to be this universal truth that we all end up dying at a certain age or an age range? Mm-hmm. Um, and there are lots of people who've done like work on like health span and having like better uh, quality of life, but really no one's actually fundamentally pushed the boundaries on, but why? Why should we die? Yep. Uh, why can't we think about this as like, uh, longevity science and like do really interesting work and you know if nothing else you're going to learn so much from this process of it and for me that the single the question on mm-hmm. we haven't quite like cracked aging right like and I was like well of course we haven't and we should and we should really like do everything we can to put resources and energy and if nothing else even if mm-hmm. all of us can't like actually help you we should at least cheer along and make sure that you're like motivated to like continue down this path. So yep. at least for that, you know, I looked at it and said, I got it. I'm, I'm a big fan now. And I have to like actually listen to all the content and watch everything. And also you're like an amazing content creator. Which yeah, wanna, like I want to get into that. I, I want to really yeah. get into that too, which is kind of, okay, okay. Let me, maybe before we get to sort of the blueprint and don't die, I, I think what is interesting to me is the Brian Johnson story, right? So and I think from what I've understood, maybe the broad strokes are you grow up Mormon, small community, sort of have a very Mormon religious upbringing. That was kind of a universe. Then you kind of become one of us. And what I mean one of us is you get into entrepreneurship. You build maybe one of the most interesting, well-known payment companies uh, uh, you know, over the last 20 years. You, you sell it. You have basically you know, a generational wealth. You can do whatever you want with that. And until that point in time, if I looked at your LinkedIn and, you know, if I kind of like didn't know you, I'd be like, I kind of know who Brian Johnson is. Um, and then it seems like you had a bunch of stuff happen to you in your life. And then you go out and emerge as, you know, this person who hunts at night. So talk to us about <laughs> like this transition, because until like 2013, 2014, I can pattern match you with any number of people that we all know in Silicon Valley. But then five years later, here you are, right? Like creating content, talking about, um, you know, um, zero principle, you're posting, you know, you have new photo shoots on Bloomberg. Talk to me about that transition. It, I can probably point to a moment where, you know, growing up, I wasn't able to dance much. It's not that the culture prevented it. It's just that we didn't dance much. And so moving my body was not something I felt free to do. And after I had sold Bridge of MO and I got a divorce and left the church, I went to a rave with some friends in Brooklyn. We went to a big warehouse. It started at 12 uh, midnight. And I started dancing for the first time in my life. And it was this euphoric moment that I could just move my body however I wanted. And I didn't need to feel shame or guilt or judged. I could just move. And I danced until six in the morning. And it was kind of this thing where uh, a few, I then became friends with a few professional dancers because I, I loved it so much and I wanted to be around them. And they called me free as my nickname. They just came up with it. And they said, you move like anyone we haven't seen before. You just absolutely just have no limitations on what you're, what, how you move your body. And that was a moment where my entire life had been about what I couldn't do. A list of rules from my religion, a list of societal expectations on what I could and could not do. And I lived in this, you know, try, the avoidance of a penalty box, mm. like, you know. And in that moment, my life switched, switched into everything that I could do. And that's what my life has been about is because I was in a position where I no one could fire me. I didn't need to be hired by anybody. Nobody could cancel me. I, for the first time in my life, I didn't have these real serious forces bearing down upon me, trying to limit uh, and put me in a, a straitjacket. Mm-hmm. And so, yes, the what I've been doing over the past uh, year with the nudes and everything I've been doing online is me being my best self, playing in the biggest playground I can find. And I've just gotten a taste of it, but like it's just starting for me. And I 
have never experienced more joy in life than I do in in pursuing this. Um, I want to maybe unpack that just a little bit because you know your brain tree that part of your career and you know obviously you know the wealth and the money. We all know people who have kind of gotten there, right? And I know people, you know those people. But after that, you know, I think a lot of them, and I might even put myself in there, you're still kind of playing the status impact mm. game in various ways, you know. And I'm guessing, you know, some of them are watching this. And I suspect some people are going to go like, what Brian's doing is cringe and, you know, why is it? I'm sure you get that. And, you know, I, I love how you deal with hate. We'll get to that. But I actually think a lot of people are watching you and they're actually mildly jealous, right? Um, and it is, and they think that, but here's somebody who's kind of doing the thing that really cares about, putting himself out there. You're unafraid of being embarrassed, which I think is a true superpower. And they would love to, I think, reverse engineer how the transition happened. So I'm guessing maybe for somebody watching this and they're like, okay, hey, can I do that? Like, why do you think that moment happened when you're dancing? What led up to it? And maybe somebody else, like, because it can't be just go out and be free. Something changed for you, which and you shifted. I help unpack that and what maybe somebody watching this can do themselves. Yeah, it's, it's my relationship with time. I read so many biographies that when I'm at a, a spot where I need wisdom, I frequently will go to people I've read about in the past. And I understand their modes of thinking so well because I've read so much on them that I can channel their thoughts, even though we may be of different ages, a few hundred years apart. And in reading these biographies, you can observe that many of these people were well ahead of their time with their ideas. And the predictable responses they got is that they were cringe or that they were crazy or that you know, there was something wrong with them because they did something contrary to the norms of that time. It's a predictable human response to reject the, the new and the unfamiliar. And so there's no reason that our time and place will be any different. If you do anything that is unfamiliar or new, you're going to create that knee-jerk reaction where humans are going to offer up some vomit of, you know, like whatever the thing is, whether it be their own self-defense mechanisms or whether it be a mirror of the zeitgeist, they're just like, it's an uncontrolled response. And so the trick I did is I imagined hanging out with the 25th century and I imagined that they respected me that they admired what I did, that when they said, we looked at the early 21st century and we're, we are assessing what allowed intelligence to thrive in this part of the galaxy, for the explosion of intelligence in this part of the galaxy, what happened in the early 21st century with Homo sapiens? That they would point at me and say, well, there was this guy, Brian Johnson, who did this thing. And it started something that helped push this thing along. And that to me was a, I was able to generate enough belief in that thought experiment in the same way I experienced other people of previous generations, that when people say things now, I don't care. I mean, I sincerely do not care what anyone thinks of me in this moment of time because the majority of the opinions are those of dead people. I really care about the 25th century respecting me. And once you, you acquire that mindset, you can just see how ridiculous the opinions are because everyone else is trying to put a straitjacket on you. They're trying to tell you the box they're comfortable with and if you violate that block, they wanted you to get back in because they feel uncomfortable. Because if you do something yeah. different, they may have to too. And so it's about it's all about them. It's not about this longer arc of intelligence succeeding succeeding in the galaxy. Oh yes. I mean, I, you know, if you look at it logically, I don't think there's anything logical about people criticizing you because you're not here trying to make money. You're not here trying to sell something, right? You're experimenting on yourself. You're putting out everything for the world. Everything is as rigorous scientifically as it can be. Go have fun. Go knock yourself out, right? Like, and so, um, and regardless of whether you succeed on it, I think if you succeed, great, right? We all live longer lives and we get to hang out with our kids. But I think I want to come back. So, by the way, folks who are watching this, I think you became famous in the last year in this context. Um, and people maybe knew you a little bit in the payments world or the tech world as the CEO of Braintree. And then obviously you had Kernel and you did a bunch of amazing work. But I spent, went down a rabbit hole over the last few weeks. Uh, I really sort of fanboyed over Brian here. Uh, but reading all of your old uh, blog posts, right? And what is fascinating to me is you can kind of see, you know, the evolution of some of your thinking. And I want to maybe ask you, talk to us about the invention of zero and the book on it and why that matters to you and, and how do you kind of apply that to your own life? Yeah, I, 
a friend of mine suggested I read uh, Zero, the biography of a dangerous idea. And I think I read it in one sitting. It just absolutely changed my life unlike any book I've ever read. Mm -hmm. And here was this story about this, uh, this character that has basically been the most revolutionary thing in human society, you know, more so than any, any human, like more so than Jesus, more so than any person. Zero has revolutionized existence more than anything. And it allowed me to basically um, uh, come up with this concept because what I was trying to do is once I sold uh, Branch of Venmo, I was trying to figure out what to do that would genuinely benefit the human race, bridging us to the 25th century. And I kept on finding in my thought experiments that I would come up against this wall of fog. Like I couldn't see past my own imagination. I couldn't see past my own intellect. I could feel where I ended. And I felt like it basically left me in a bad place where I couldn't push forward. And so one night I went to bed trying to think about how to solve this problem. And that night I dreamt about uh, this concept of zeroth principle thinking. I'd read the book Zero. I was very familiar with the concept. And zero was kind of the twin to first principle thinking. First principle thinking says, you gather all the knowledge you can, and you assume nothing, and then you walk forward in this methodical way, trying to solve you know, whatever problem you're after. Zero principle thinking says, you don't know. You don't have the working knowledge. And so when, when Einstein was working on the special theory of relativity, you couldn't get there from Newtonian physics with first principle thinking. It was a zero principle insight. The same thing is true with germ theory. The same thing is true you know, with so many examples of zero uh, that has revolutionized existence. And so, uh, with this zero principle thought, I, I paired that with all of my ideas of like, wh how does intelligence thrive? How do we get to the thriving of, of intelligence in this galaxy? And it was basically all the ideas I've been blogging about mm -hmm. paired with zero, where the observation was as a species, we are moving from a first principles-based reality where we build based upon knowledge and being the stewards of that knowledge to go out, walk into an AI dominant future where we are no longer the stewards of knowledge. AI will be much better at that than we are. And our value is not going to be knowledge mastery. It's not going to be first principle thinking. Our value is going to be in zero principle thinking and be able to exist in an environment where we don't know. And that didn't let me down a whole bunch of, you know, a branched path of like what I do with Blueprint. But this is the most significant revolution in Homo sapiens history. Mm -hmm. There's nothing bigger of the transition we're, we're moving. And what I'm basically proposing is looking at the speed of AI, let's just say it's a million times smarter than us, let alone a billion in 10 years time. That is unimaginable to us. And, you know, we may be the architects of this thing. We may not, like we don't know, but we basically are in this moment where we can't know anything. We cannot predict anything. And so I was trying to piece together, given after 4.5 billion years on this earth, where it's this moment or we're baby steps away from super intelligence, how do we understand existence? Like in the most basic way. And if you look out in the world and you say, okay, I have this really important question about simple things like what to eat for breakfast and these really existential questions like why do I exist and you know, like the full spectrum of questions and I wanted to basically put together, um, I wanted to embody the problem, I wanted to be the problem and I wanted a philosophical problem that others could understand to answer the burning question of the early 21st century uh, that we homo sapiens have to answer every second of every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you in one of the interviews you quoted, uh, you know, the philosopher Camus, and you know, and the way I interpreted that was, uh, you know, basically every, all of us trying to figure out the meaning of life. By this, maybe the deepest sort of philosophical you ever gotten on this podcast. So thank you, Brian. Yeah. Right? Like we're gonna have we're gonna have nudes soon too. We might have to order it, <laughs> but uh, uh, it, it, it's gonna be it's gonna be quite the crazy hour. Uh, but uh, uh, Brian can't drink, so but we can drink. Uh, so. <laughs> uh, you know, but I, I think, he, 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 I'll stop. but I think what what you're trying to point out is that um, you know Camus' kind of whole theory was, hey, you know, if you don't want to kill yourself, you know, you got to figure out what the meaning of life is. And the way I misinterpreted you, uh, what you just said, and what you said is, we know nothing about this AI future. We can predict nothing, know nothing. Every thought yeah. piece that is out there on Twitter about AI futures, yeah. nobody knows shit. 
What we do yeah. know is let's not die, right? That is sort of a human impulse. So let's just do that, right? Is it maybe a fair summary, uh, maybe an oversimplified summary? Well said. Okay, wow. All right, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, I want to, let's get into the meat of this because, um, and I, I, I highly suggest people read this blog post. I think it shows what a great phenomenal thinker you are uh, on lots of uh, you know, topics. Okay, so Blueprint, right? And, um, and, you know, so a lot of people watch your uh, content and, you know, they've done, you know, uh, you know, they've had all the while and veggie wants all of this stuff. But maybe for somebody watching this, right? Um, and if there is kind of like a stack rank of, okay, if you do nothing else, do yeah. this. Because I think one of the things you try and say is like, hey, listen, you don't have to do what I do, right? Like you have the resources, yeah. you have the discipline, you have insane like, you know, sleep scores for the last eight months. You're trying to say I'm on the edge so that, you know, you folks can live out here. So maybe walk us through if you're doing nothing else, this is step one. And then, you know, you kind of ascend the ladder all the way to, you know, where you get to, you know, Mr. Knight Hunter, Brian Johnson. Yeah. Okay. I'll give you seven things. And these are the power laws. Then they're doable by most everyone. Number one, don't smoke. Number two is six hours of exercise per week. Now, if you can't do six, one is great. If you're, you know, if you're doing zero, like one is better than none. So just get some exercise. Three is eat a blueprint like or Mediterranean like diet. Four is maintain a BMI between 18.5 and 22.5. Five is moderate alcohol consumption. I currently do zero, so I do no alcohol consumption. Uh, number six is stopping bad habits. You know, it's like smoking is like a stopping a bad thing, but there are other things you do which are bad habits. So like mo this number six thing is caught, like if, if you are not overeating, you're not going to have a BMI above 22.5. But like, if there are bad habits in your life that's actively causing disease and dysfunction, don't do those things. And then seven is sleep. Make sleep your number one life priority because every other number of things becomes easier when you're well slept. So life revolves around sleep. And so it's lately really been deprioritized by society, seen as a source of weakness and of wasted time. And the reality is it's exactly opposite. It's the best investment one can make with their time. This is amazing. I think uh, one of the criticisms I read about you on uh, on various platforms, uh, and you know, at some point we were, I actually collected a list of like insults, which I thought was hilarious. Um, awesome. I almost think these like, you look at them and it almost like motivates you in a way. Uh, but uh, one of the things I hear as like criticism um, is the science of this is less proven, right? And uh, it's not rigorous or it's not, he's not an expert. Like he doesn't have a degree in this. Um, and, you know, he's not a doctor. Like, why is he telling us like how to live our lives? This is crazy. Um, and so I guess for me, when you, you talk about these seven things, why these and why not? And when you look at like things like BMI or when you look at like six hours of exercise, how did you come up with the, to the conclusion that like this is kind of the range that you should be? I, I kind of know where you're getting at, but I'm curious to think uh, to understand your process on how you came up with these. Yeah. The, the unique thing we did, two things really, is we combed through every single scientific publication on health span and lifespan. Right. We then graded the evidence according to bio statistical criteria, and then we stack ranked them. And then we said, we're going to play the power laws of evidence. Mm -hmm. And then we implemented in me, one human, every power law of longevity. And then we did the same thing with population scale stuff. And so that's the unique thing we've done. And so I became the most measured person in human history. And so if you basically say, okay, everyone in the world of health and wellness agree disagrees on everything. Mm. Nobody agrees on anything. So therefore, how would you even begin to try to find a source of truth? I would, I, I would suggest that I am the best representation of truth that exists in the world today. We are the most scientifically robust endeavor ever done. Mm -hmm. And we've measured me more than anyone ever in history. And we've shared the entire thing. Now you can try to take a shot and say, it doesn't matter. You're N of one insignificant. 
fine. Like you don't do it. <laughs> but yeah. for everyone else, everyone else that is struggling to know what to eat for breakfast, you know, like you need to go somewhere for a starting point. Mm-hmm. And so we just started a, uh, a BP 5000 where we have, we have thousands of people implementing a basic blueprint stack. Mm-hmm. They're doing robust measurement on the front end. They're robu- doing robust measurement on the back end. But to me, you know, like blueprint solves this. There's like this highbrow contemplation of uh, where these people are coming at. Yeah. Meanwhile, my parents are in their 70s. Mm-hmm. Like they're experiencing the ravages of aging. They don't care what the disagreements are. They want to know what to eat for breakfast. They don't want to hurt in the morning. They don't want their brain to be deteriorated. Like they have these hyper practical, urgent questions. And that's what I'm trying to solve for people. And so like, if it takes time for the scientific community to roll around, that's no surprise. That's a process that's happening for hundreds of years. It's not going to change. So like if anyone is waiting for for consensus, like you could do that, you might be dead by then. But like for those who want to do something now, I've got an answer for you. you know, if you read a lot of the criticism, one of the things that always stands out to me, you know, is nobody's actually such an alternative. And, uh, you know, it's just like, we just, and there's kind of like sort of a disapproval of maybe your wealth or maybe, you know, your aesthetics or whatever. And, you know, by the way, I highly recommend, you know, I think every interview you've done, you've kind of covered your day and the supplements and, you know, and I highly recommend like people go check out the Blueprint site. And one of my favorite videos uh, that you've done is the one where you kind of go through a tour of your house. Yeah. And what, so which I want to make a bigger point here because a lot of the, if you look at the stack rank list of things you said, diet, sleep, exercise, I go like, okay, I get that, right? Like any of us who's kind of been online for the last 10 years, you are like, I, I get it, right? Like we've heard this stuff before. But what is really surprising to me about you is you what seems like a superhuman amount of willpower, okay? Mm-hmm. Here you are. Right. You know, you could do anything in the world. You could be on a private yacht. You could be, you know, building your next company, raising billions of dollars, whatever it is you want to do. But here you are every single day doing the exact same thing, measuring yourself, right? Like going to bed at the exact same time, turning down n number of fun things and opportunities and whatnot. And the reason I'm prepared that is I think a lot of people, when they listen to you, they're like, I get it. I get the science, et cetera. And probably there's like stuff you do on the edge, but all of stuff is just basics, right? Eat less, eat healthier. I know that, you know, yeah. but I've never done anything about it for 40 <laughs> years, right? Yeah. <laughs> because I didn't have the discipline. I bet I'm trying now and et cetera, which I'll get to. Um, so I guess the question for you is two parts. One, where do you get that willpower from? And B, if somebody watching this, they're like, yeah, I get eat less exercise. I have heard it. Like, I need to do it. Like, what do I do? Because you could talk about like different Brian's and recommendations, but so talk to us about your willpower and maybe how somebody can you know get some of that. Yeah, the the moment you need willpower, you've already lost. Hmm. Interesting. None of us, none of us have the willpower to withstand self, and so it's entirely about building systems and structures. So, for example, in my house, I don't have anything in here that I can, in my home, that I can eat that would get me in trouble. Mm-hmm. I just don't put myself in circumstances that require willpower because we all- Marty, so when we do dinner with Brian, he's coming over to our house, right? <laughs> 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 that, yeah. we, have, we definitely have stuff here that gets people in trouble. I do want to say, <laughs> when I looked at like your diet plan, I was like, the, I I fully expected it to be like, just food that I, I can't really eat. It's like, oh my yeah. God, it's going to be gross or whatever. But for the most part, this is basically what we eat. Like, you know, we, we for especially coming from like a vegetarian background, um, it, it's it's not super different. So I was pleasantly surprised and I was like, oh, I could actually do this. And I looked at a lot of the YouTube comments of like mo- almost all of your videos or most at least like last 10 or so. To me, like when we think about your criticism and stuff, there is this elite class of people who kind of want to look at you and say either, hey, he's not, he's, he's not really qualified. Why is he giving us advice? Or, oh, it's just a rich guy doing this like rich guy project. And uh, he's just being selfish, you know. Mm-hmm. Every, no human being should like really focus so much on living longer. Like what's he going to do? Yeah. Everybody has to die. Like wh- why, why is he being so selfish? I actually think it is the most selfless thing that you could yeah. do to go do this to yourself on a daily basis, like just science the shit out of this 
and uh, and actually put it out there um, for everyone to like learn and understand and do it. So when I started seeing the comments on YouTube, overwhelmingly, it is super positive. And it is not just yeah. like positive from, it, uh, you know, it was incredibly positive from a lot, from this big cohort of like people from low economic background, where they were like, it is incredible to me that me, as somebody who can't have access to a ton of resources, can actually do this and aspire to live longer and have a really good quality of life. Like consistently, that kind of a comment was mind blowing. Like, and I wish I could like just take those and show it to the critics. And I think you, you know, if I were you, I would have probably been like, look at this, look at this, yeah. look at this all day long. You, you obviously are like a much nicer person than me. And you take the high road on a lot of this stuff. You almost like treat it as a game, which I love. Mm -hmm. But I, I see the, the, the comments on YouTube and stuff. And to me, it is like the work that you do comes from a place of incredible selflessness. It's not about being selfish. And I wish yeah. there a lot of people could like realize that. Mm. Yeah. Thank you uh, for that. Uh, I, I want to get back. Okay. I understand removing temptation from your life, right? You know, by the way, since the new year, I've been trying to do this where I'm like trying to you know, remove temptation in terms of food. But there's another part, which is you're getting up every day at the same time, you're working out, you're going to bed early, you're probably turning on other fun things. So I, is there a morning where like, God damn it, I don't feel like doing it today. I just want to sleep in and I want to scroll through Instagram or like, do you ever have that? Of, of course. I mean, so two things. One is I did a study at Kernel with my brain interface where we looked at my willpower based upon sleep data. And we saw that my willpower dramatically uh, lowered when I had lower REM and lower deep sleep. So how much you can control yourself and avoid doing the things you actually don't want to do, which you're tempted to do and you do anyways, based largely upon sleep. And so I think many people will see my behavior and it's an incomprehensible thing for them. But I think it actually becomes comprehensible when, if they were able to achieve high quality sleep on a regular basis, and if they were able to eat nutritional foods, and if they were able to exercise and avoid bad things in their life, it has this compounded effect where it really does give you superpower, willpower. Like it really is there. And so I know that from a, a person who's sleep deprived, poorly nourished, and doesn't exercise, it's an unimaginable jump. So then, of course, their only move is to criticize. The only way they can understand their existence is to tear me down. Mm -hmm. So it's understandable. Like I get the whole system, but I would just, you know, like once you get on the other side, you're like, yep. Like, and then the, to like the days where you wake up and you don't want to do it, I know that not doing it creates more pain than doing it. And I know this so well. So it's like, I know the, the piece of pizza is going to be so awful. I'm going to feel so awful. My sleep is going to be terrible. I'm going to be grumpy the next day. It's going to have this knock-on effect. Hmm. I don't want it. And, or like being in bed and scrolling, I'm going to feel <laughs> awful about myself. So, Brian, I need to stop you there. So, just so for the audience understands, we are recording this at Friday, 8.30 p.m. London time, right? Because <laughs> and Brian was kind enough to do this for us. And Friday is when we have our weekly cheat meal. Right, like where we go take out and all our now I'm like just losing my appetite as I'm hearing Brian. Like you know, I'm like I don't know, I don't know. I, right? you, like you know, that's just I, usual. And for me, I w I was going to like interrupt Brian and be like, but in that moment though, that slice of pizza tastes delicious. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I would go in all my misery just to like bite into that slice. Yeah, you know, I, I, have a, I have a reality show idea for Brian where basically people <laughs> tempt you with different kinds of food and vices and you kind of see how far your willpower is. It's a little wild on YouTube, trust me, right? Like you can thank me later. Uh, uh, but maybe we're going to see this point. Like, okay, you built, you know, you know, the you. I mean, it's so obvious you kind of have this engineer type thinking and you architect the solution. But then you conquer this other world of basically entering into the public narrative, right? Like, and I've seen this arc of the most tested human being, this billionaire who spends $2 million a year, et cetera, to all of a sudden, you have fantastic YouTube content, you have, you're really funny on Twitter, right? You engage with everybody, right? You're great at engaging. So I guess two parts, talk to us about that journey, because I don't think you did that before. Um, yeah. And the second part is maybe for somebody else who's like, you know, I want to create an online movement. I want to understand content creation. Like, you know, mm. what are lessons that people could learn from what you've accomplished? 
I had I had never thought of this before. Uh, I think you know if you look at my social media usage before uh, abilities before this, I don't think I was very good at all. And so the one day in, in October of 2022, somebody for the first time wrote something, did something on Twitter that went viral, like summarizing what the protocol was. And it was the first time that people were being exposed to these ideas. And there was this colossal amount of hate that was directed my way. And I just woke up one morning and it just started hammering me. And I was like, oh my God, what, what I, you know, I thought that this would be like, people would appreciate uh, suggestions on what they should do. And I never imagined I was triggering this hate bomb. And so, these responses started coming in and I was like, what do I do? You know, like, do you fight it? Do you play with it? Like, do you, and it, I don't know, like just, my fingers start tapping and what came out was just play. It was just like a, a yes and approach. Mm -hmm. So, I honestly don't even know. It wasn't planned. It was, there was no forethought. It just what happened on that day. And it was so much fun uh, to do that. <laughs> and I guess in contrast, like, you know, Fighting is really ugly. Everyone kind of hates it. Like you get the arousal, like tribal conflict. But then that day was so much fun. I was online for like <laughs> 12 hours straight, uh, just kind of uh, sparring with people. And I saw that like when someone came at me really hard and I would say yes and to their joke, all the hatred just disappeared. Like they were out of fire. Like th the whole thing just absolutely uh, vanished. And so I was like, hey, this is interesting. If this is going to be a thing, like this seems like a good approach. Hmm. Uh, by the way, I think you are packing so much skill into that. Like one of my favorite things, and maybe I should find the tweet where uh, uh, I, I would never, you know, because I think a lot of people talk about, and you talk about your appearance, right? Somebody's going to make comment about, you know, uh, you being pale and there's kind of comment about you being a vampire. And my favorite thing is like you came over and said like, yeah, I hunt at night, right? And it was just so <laughs> funny, right? Like it, it was just so perfect. And I was like, this guy understands Twitter, right? Like this guy totally... <laughs> understands uh you know uh, uh twitter um and uh you know the other thing i want to kind of pay you a compliment on is i think people a lot of people see brian's videos where uh your own videos and i highly suggest watching them but my favorite and i'm told you this one of my favorite things that you do is when you do videos with other people because it does two things it it shows you how much you you know care about this topic right uh, in such a genuine way and second, it just shows how much you want to kind of coach and help other people. So, uh, you know, pro tip, you just totally do more of that uh, because I think it just kind of like, because then you see a reference point of you know, uh, why you're interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, you know, you, this kind of becomes like a, I'm not going to say the word cult because it's like a negative connotation, but yeah. the phrase don't die, uh, yeah. you know, the fact that you're having meetups now. Talk to us about, the, it's, I think it's kind of a movement. I, I think I call it a movement. Where do you see this all headed, right? Like, and, you know, uh, where does this all go for you in terms of like, you know, uh, uh, this, I don't know, this ideological, you know, a thing that you've been working on? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I thought about this question for like 10 years, you know, like after brain treatment, like I was really starting to think about it. And... To me, what it, what it seems like is that artificial intelligence is the most important development in history on this earth. We've given birth to the form of intelligence. So, what does that mean? And to me, it is summarized in that it's an alien form of intelligence that is arriving and we know nothing. We don't know what we want. We don't know what we think. We don't know, um, like basically, there's, there's like one thing to say, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, mm -hmm. but it's an entirely another thing to say, and you don't even know what you want, is basically, you're, I, what I'm suggesting is, as a species, we've always thought of our minds as the deity of our own existence. Our minds know what we want. Our minds tell us what to do. We can map out. And what I'm suggesting is this shift is so fundamental, like so uh, all-encompassing that it calls into question every single thing we know about existence. The only thing I know is I want to continue to breathe. Mm -hmm. And so, in trying to capture like how big is this moment and what is this moment demanding of us? It's not asking, it's demanding of us that we be responsive because it's, you know, a, 
existence is unforgiving. It's not going to stop itself based upon our preference of existence. Like it's just going to roll through. We either adapt and survive or we're dead. And so don't die. It forces you, it forces one to reconcile existence. Like if it, you, you can't just dismiss it as a stupid idea. You have to basically say, no, 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 I choose to die and here's my value system to support it. You have to take a side. And so it's like if you if you said something like live long or live great or be your best self, you know, that passes all of your filters like I'm already doing it. But when you say don't die, you have to go down your stack of existence and question every assumption about everything you ever understood about reality. And so, you know, people it takes some time for people to realize that it's questioning everything they understand about themselves. But that's what it really is. It, it's the most provocative and useful philosophical approach that we could contemplate right now. I, I want to ask you a little bit about that because I think part of the challenge, and I'm not taught deeply about this at all, and you obviously have, is part of the challenge people have with this is that it seems so inevitable, like entropy or heat death of the universe. Yeah. And you yeah. seem so powerless. And to be honest, you look at everything that you're doing, right? Like, I think you know, I hope not, but I think the odds are we may not be around 200 years from now. And and I think the way most people tackle this, I'm not going to deal with that, right? I'm going to get hit by a car, or I'm, you know, I'm going to get some, you know, incurable disease or whatever. I'm yeah. just going to yeah. optimize the time I have yeah. now. You know, do you see that? Because I think that's often for a lot of people, that's the challenge they have with the kind of thinking yeah. you're talking about. Yep. So as I do most of the time, thought experiments are my best way around questions. Mm-hmm. So let's imagine we are hanging out with Homo erectus a million years ago. And we say, Homo erectus, tell us why you're excited about the future of existence. Like, tell us, like, do you want to continue to exist? And what do you think is possible with your evolutionary intelligence? Now, we, we all know that conversation would be more comical than it would be informative. You know, like, Homo erectus would be like, well, I've killed all the animals in the local area. I've like, you know, whatever, like whatever things. Mm-hmm. We would not expect Homo erectus to bridge us to the future and say, and talk about the unbelievable situation we're in now with all of our technology and our ability to, to engineer real, like the matter, you know, biology, atoms. It was unimaginable. And so to really internalize this question, the serious contemplation is, are we Homo erectus? Are we that primitive relative to where we'll be in a very short period of time? Mm. If that is the case, you know, it, a, a wise Homo erectus would say, I have absolutely nothing to say about anything about the future. I don't know what I'm going to want. Mm. I don't know how I'm going to feel. I don't know what to say, whether to say I'm excited or scared. I absolutely know nothing. Now, if we would be wise, we would say, you know what? We may be identical, if not worse, than Homo erectus with all of our biases about negativity. There's no reason why we should have any opinions about the future. There's like we we there's no reason we should be excited and no reason we should be worried. We absolutely do not know. And that's why I come back to the only thing we do know is don't die. You're just buying the option to say, I can play in the game. But this this hits so deep. Because humans exist in knowing things. So when you pose this question, we can't help ourselves but to say, I think this, or I feel that, or I suspect this, or I predict that, or I model that. We can't. And so it, it takes this. Usually, I, I've been having these dinners at my house for the past few years. I'll do about 10 to 12 people, and I walk them through a five-step process on the future of being human. It takes two and a half hours to get someone to even understand the basics of these thoughts because the mind is so loud and so eager to shut down everything that challenges its authority about knowing. It just, you have to go through like 10 or 15 times where you catch your mind again and again and again, trying to, to basically know things and predict things. And it's just, we're not in that moment anymore. I love that. I'd never thought about it that way on don't die. To me, when I was in my early twenties, um, one of my coworkers was in his mid forties, and uh, I think at some point in the in the cafeteria, um, he saw me eat like like a, a cup noodles or something of that sort. You know, like you just like pour hot water and you like make the noodles and you eat it. And it was like three a.m. in the morning, 
I was like working all night. And so um, I was like eating this and just like going back to work. And uh, the next day he kind of said, you know, um, you should really like take better care of yourself. And uh, you should probably not be like eating this like junky food at like three in the morning. And I was like, well, you know, I feel fine. Like I slept great. I doing okay. And he was like, you're so young that you, you're not going to realize how much you're taking your health for granted. Um, and I'm now, you know, almost like twice your age. And uh, I can now, I can see the impact of all of that. And uh, if I could go back in time and fix all of those things, yeah. I would. I definitely would do that. Um, so th my advice to you is to like just not take it for granted. And, you know, and he just kind of like said that not in like this patronizing way or anything. He just mm -hmm. was like, I'm just trying to like tell you message from the future kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay. And it kind of like, you know, made me think a bit. And I always think about that when I see your don't die, you're right in that it is this conscious thought or decision that you have to make for every single action in your day to be like, am I doing this because I don't want to die or am I choosing to die? Like, which one am I going to do? Because nobody wants to talk about death. It is so gloomy and morbid. But really, all that we are doing, it's kind of like, what is it? Uh, I think Douglas Adams said this in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where he was like, all that you do by walking is just trying to escape gravity. You try to jump and you fall and that's what you do. And all that you do every day is to like, you know, die a bit. And uh, and so anything that you can do to reverse that in a conscious way, you should yep. be aiming to go do that because why won't you? Because that that's good, right? So I like that because it's a very declarative, simple statement. I also like the branding of it. I think it's just like a genius and just how simple and clean it is uh, on on just building this community around it. Um, you know, we kind of jumped ahead on, um, you know, the protocol and everything else. But for folks who are like kind of new to you, new to this whole system, like I think by now they've gotten the gist of like not dying, longevity, all of that. But what is Blueprint? What is What does the protocol entail? And, you know, how do you go about it? I, you know, give us like a primer on this. Yeah. Uh, basically, each of us dies a little bit every single day, every single minute of every single day. And we wanted to take an approach and say, okay, just like you can measure money in a bank account, or you can measure inflation, or you can measure any other metric, can you measure your speed of death? And if you can measure your speed of death across your entire body, so how fast, how much did my heart die today? And how much did my liver die today? then if you can measure it and then you can test things to die less, that's successful. And so some of my metrics, for example, like my, I, I've lowered my speed of aging, the, the rate in which I die by the equivalent of 31 years. So my body now accumulates aging damage slower than 88% of 18 year olds. The older you get, the faster you age and it compounds upon itself. And so, you really want to slow that. And so, to put it in layman's terms, for every 12 months that pass, I age eight months. I get four for free. And we're trying to drive that down more and more. So, imagine it's getting to a point where six months of the year pass and you get six months free. And so, we're basically trying to say in this moment of time, slow your speed of aging as much as possible. And the technologies are now coming out where you can then rejuvenate, regenerate the things that have aged. So if my heart, if I'm chronologically 46, but my heart is biologically 37, a technology may be able to regenerate it so it's 32 or 27 or 25. And so we're just playing in the spectrum of die less right now and be around long enough for the powerful technologies that are going to be able to regenerate you and get you back to more youthful states. And so this is a, a new sport. I created a Rejuvenation Olympics leaderboard because so much of health and wellness was this like pick your guru kind of thing. And, and I wanted to say we can standardize. We can have one point a system. We can all compare our data. We can share our protocols. If somebody's beating someone else, you can share with everyone else. So I tried to make a sport out of it because humans love to compete. And it's been an unbelievable success. Like now this leaderboard is such a powerful status signal of Somebody's on the leaderboard and they're like, now they're feeling great. And they tell all their friends about it. It's been unbelievable because you now have a standardized approach. 
And so when, whenever uh, you, put, you put it into a, a number system, like you know how many followers you have on social media, you know how much money is in your bank account, like those are very clear rules and you know how to play the game and how to win. And now I'm trying to say there's a new game to play. It's how fast you're aging or how slow you're aging. Yeah. And that's the new status signaler for uh, people to work on. I promised myself that I will not ask you about penis rejuvenation because you've been asked it every single time, right? Like, uh, also, I never said the phrase penis rejuvenation on this podcast, so that was the first. Um, but, you know, the thing <laughs> which I like, uh, uh, there you go, it's the first. Uh, uh, and by the way, people want to, you know, you talk about it a lot, and it's actually quite interesting. I think a very underexplored area for, uh, you know, male health. Um, but maybe talk, to, one of the things I like about that and others is like, you're kind of on the cutting edge, and you, you make yourself the guinea pig. You kind of help us see around the corner a little bit, like, to next two, five years, what are you excited about? Maybe things are just not here yet and you're kind of looking at the paper. Give us two, three things that you're excited about in the future. Yeah, uh, I'm doing two things in the next few months that I'm excited about. I just did my first gene therapy, which was folostatin. It was the seventh best performing therapy in our power law ranking with extended lifespan over 30%. So I did that gene therapy in December, uh, in October. And then I did a second therapy in December, which is I did 100 million mesenchymal stem cells intravenously done uh, from young Swedish bone marrow. Now that's ranked in the, er, in the low 30s as power law ranking. So we're starting to get really high power ranking therapies incorporated into the protocol. I'm doing my second longevity gene therapy in two months. And uh, this will be around cognitive enhancement and, and brain health. And then I'm also doing a whole body a joint rejuvenation. So I'll be injecting every joint in my body with these young Swedish bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells. Our target is to try to get my joints to age 18. Now that's kind of a ridiculous goal because no one's ever done that before. And there's no reason to think we can achieve it, but it's, it's a fun goal to pursue at a minimum. We will be able to regenerate the joints a reasonable amount. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, everyone understands joints. Everyone understands aching knees and hips and everything else and especially someone ages. So those are the two more powerful ones. But the things we're excited about is your diet, sleep, exercise, uh, those really do have the power law rankings or what we can do right now. Gene therapy is next level. That's how we're going to break through. Like exercise, I have to do every day, right? And for an hour, and it, like sometimes it sucks. Gene therapy, you just get a shot and it works on your behalf. You never have to think about it. So gene therapy is just beautiful because it, it asks less of you to achieve these remarkable health outcomes. Now, it's just like Ozempic, right? Like you take a pill and it solves this really big problem. So I'd say we're very, very close to these breakout therapies, significantly improving our health and wellness and getting gains where I think I think there could be a snap in the zeitgeist to, to don't die faster than anyone thinks possible. It just takes a few yeah. therapies and a few examples, like we are off the species and all of a sudden yeah. grind culture is, is barbaric. And like the idea of of um, uh, you know like of debaucherous behaviors as this idea of this idealized version of living life is seen as primitive. Like we are so close to that snapping. Yeah, um, I you know I think you know my father uh, passed away you know in the mid two thousands and he was a writer and I always think about like he would just miss the internet. And, you know if you have the internet yeah. you've done so many other things. And the reason I bring that up is I often think about like it'd be tragic if we are the last generation which kind of just missed you know. The, you know, yeah. sentient AGI thing. Okay. One last topic I want to ask you about, which is, uh, I'd ask this because you bring it up, other people bring it up, which is honestly the way you look, right? And I think you kind of covered, uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, there's a funny quote to Solana the other day about like, you know, you have this midriff showing conspiracy and you talk a lot about, <laughs> hey, these are the, that's right, the mid, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the midriff Illuminati, right? But the point is, I think, you know, you the way I understand it is you take pleasure in being able to do things that you could not do when you were running a payments company, right? I can't imagine you in money 2020 in Vegas going up, doing the keynote, right? And wearing a blue tank top like that. You know, <laughs> yeah, I would not recommend it, right? But, and I guess the question for you is, do you ever think about like, hey, you know, if you get a tan, wear a suit, look quote unquote normal, look like Fauci, and then spread the message, is there a world where you might be more quote unquote acceptable or are you just having too much fun? Do you ever think about that? Yeah. When I study history, it's what you're looking for is punctuated equilibrium. You're looking for uh, 
a, a huge amount of change in a very small window of time. You're not looking for gradual acceptance. And what I'm doing at Blueprint uh, and Don't Die, I'm not looking for a linear growth of acceptance. I'm looking for an exogenous shock of punctuated equilibrium, where one day I'm hated and the next day the entire world is in on Don't Die. Mm -hmm. And those things, that does not swing on these small aesthetic conditions of like whether tan is good or, or, you know, my current, my appearance, those don't matter. It's a zeitgeist that snaps. And so, that's not the game I'm playing. And so, it actually helps because the more hatred I get and the more resistance I get, the more energy it builds resisting the snap. And then once it hits, it snaps so much harder. And so, you actually, I actually want the counter energy. It just makes it, uh, it, it increases, the, increases the tension. And so, to me, yeah, the last thing in the whole world I want to do is anything that increases uh, acceptance according to current norms. I want every founder who's watching this to listen to that last part because I think that's how you create a mission-oriented company, product, whatever you want to do. That's how you do it. Um, I know you're always out of time. I want to ask you one, maybe in like a 30-second answer, which is, if there's one thing you want our listeners just to remember, take away, do whatever, just one message outside of, you know, blueprint and, you know, check out all of your content, which I highly recommend. Yeah. What would be the one thing yeah. you want to leave them with? Yeah. Be an epic homo sapien and transition yourself to become an epic homo evolutus. This is our moment after billions of years of evolution. We have the opportunity to create the most spectacular existence known to this galaxy. Put behind you the silliness of debauchery and current norms and be epic. Be respected by the 20th century. Oh my God. That might be the most... We've asked this people the question to other guys. That might be the most epic answer we ever gotten. Brian, um, I don't know how to size you up. I think you're amazing. You're definitely one of a kind. Uh, I don't know whether you succeed, but I hope to God uh, that you do. And, you know, in 100 years, you should come back on our show and we should do this all over again. Uh, but you know, thank you so, so much. This was such a blast. I think you're unique. And, you know, I think me and others are cheering for you. Even if right after this, we're going to have some alcohol and drinks, eat some food, but you're so awesome. Thank you so much. For <laughs> thank you so, so much for doing this. I'm so, so happy. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. This was amazing.